Stanley Kubrick was one of the most innovative film directors in the history of cinema. When he died on March 7, 1999, he left behind an astonishing body of work. But because of the veil of mystery that surrounded this director, he also left behind many questions about his life and his career. They are revealed in a new documentary, Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures. It was magnificent. One of his pictures are equivalent to 10 of somebody else's. Oh, Nicole. And shake his head. And you know him, and nobody ever really knew him. He was known as a, uh, a kind of future threat. One of the all-time great motion picture makers. A future threat to peace and quiet. Legendary meanness. There were times he drove me crazy. He was a very lovable individual. I love him one minute, and the next minute I hate him. I could kill him. Perhaps the most intelligent person I've ever met. He got fascinated with Nescafe commercials. Have you seen the film Groundhog Day? Because they told stories so fast. Well, that's what it was like. This man was born to push the envelope. There is still a part of Stanley that's a great mystery to me. And he always pushed the envelope. And you must expect someone like that to be different from the rest of us. I think we were too scared of him over here. Everybody pretty much acknowledges he's the man. And uh, I still feel that underrates him. <laughs> Joining me now for a look back at the life and work of Stanley Kubrick, his wife of 42 years, Christiane Kubrick, John Harlan, the director of this new documentary and Kubrick's longtime producer, and filmmaker Martin Scorsese. I am pleased to have all of them here to celebrate, is what we do here, celebrate an extraordinary career in film by a very interesting man. Let me talk about the filmmaker first. What made him so good? Well, I think... For one thing, you know, you go to movies, you go to movies to be, to be involved in the picture, uh, to get a sense, I just want to, I want to lose myself up in that screen for a few hours, and uh, uh, in a sense, know what it's like to be human, yeah. in a way. Um, then you come across certain kinds of films that um, when you go to the theater and when you see them, you're completely surprised. They make you look at life a different way. They make you look at being human a different way. They touch areas that you don't want to touch sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's provoke, provoke you, which right. is good. Um, and then there's that rarest of films where when you see it continually over years, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, you still see more in it. And what's even better is that if you're making pictures, you go back to this well, this source, for A, inspiration, and B, maybe should be a is to learn to learn how to make yeah. pictures to learn and remember when you get tired especially if you make 10 or 12 films in your life and you, uh, you get tired you say why how can I get that better what, what can I do y you look at that source you look at that inspiration you say well Kubrick Kubrick wouldn't let it stay this way yes. he would have he would have changed that angle he would have worked it out he would have tried to figure out getting more time to shoot the scene this way or that way he would have he would have really seen it through to its end yeah. and for that inspiration I, I must say I, mean, I must say uh, it, it's it, looking at his films um, and there's many ways I look at his films besides on a big screen I like watching them on television I like watching with the sound off 
so I can see the rhythm you do of the, that? Watch yeah, him with the sound I, off. sometimes you can see the rhythm of the cutting and the camera moves. And when he cuts in a two shot conversation, the classic one is Mr. Grady yeah. and um, Jack Torrance in the bathroom. Right. right. Uh, crossing the invisible line. Right, right, right. With the red background. Yeah. Uh, the cuts. And uh, when he cuts, when he destroys the invisible line, and when the shot gets tighter, on which line of dialogue? Your son has a very great talent. I don't think you are aware how great it is that he is attempting to use that very talent against your will. Remember, Jan, I think, and isn't there a piece in the film where he says, don't you want to be perfect? Does Stanley say something like that to someone, don't you want it to be perfect? Uh, yes, well, it is, it's a story that, um, that goes like this. Uh, Tom Cruise and Sidney Pollack have a dialogue about the many takes and how long it took to do a particular scene. And... Uh, uh, Sydney says, oh, and after three weeks, you know, we were still on this. And then Tom says, well, and Stanley said, Sydney, I mean, I know, I didn't think it would take that long, but don't you want to get it right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> so what's the connect between the genius on film that we see and the genius in the man? I mean, what was it about him? Well, yeah. um... I suppose the reason I loved him is because in his own life he had the same enormous attention to what is important and not peop many people do that so he was very interesting. Yeah. You met him first when he came to California, yes? Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Why did you meet him first? Um, he hired me in Germany. Uh, he made Path Glory and he wanted in the end it, uh, a lyrical note. And so he wrote a scene about a girl being dragged on a stage to a lot of rowdy soldiers singing a song. So he's looking for an actress. Yeah. And uh, he hired me. That's how I met him. Roll tape. Take a look at this. And als man ihm die Botschaft brachte, Dass sein Herz Liebchen im Sterben lag. Now, the relationship started soon after that? Um, yes, uh, my shooting wasn't until the end of the film. And uh, he uh, sought me out at a masked ball. Yeah. Uh, there's a big carnival in, in Munich, um, Fasnacht. And all the people that work in theaters there are hired for great uh, Red Cross balls. So he got somebody to take him there and um, he looked for me and that's how I met him so we were already living together when I shot the scene so you were living together when you shot the scene yeah, yeah. Where, where do you think I mean is it just this most difficult question to ask what makes a great artist I mean what was do it you about know? I don't, I don't I, know but I'm asking hopefully it stays a secret you know yeah. it's, it's interesting that one cannot know um, just having seen AI, I realized that's what's interesting about people, if anything. Well, you've just seen AI, mm. the, the new Kubrick mm -hmm. film that's finished mm. by Steven Spielberg. Yes. Yeah. yes. And you've Fantastic. seen it, and, and what does it tell you? It, it oh, it pushes many buttons, I mean, and very, very clearly. You, you, it's, it, it's got many layers. It's a wonderful film, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. And I was sort of in an emotional mangle sitting there. I'm very glad there were so many names to be read afterwards so I could pull myself together. <laughs> it's a very, very good film. And uh, so what makes an artist? Thank God, you know, you can't explain it. Just hope that it's there. Hope, and hope that, that you are one. Continues. <laughs> How did he think of himself? I mean, he started as a photographer. Yeah, he hoped that he was good. He, he, he hoped that he hoped was good. Hoped that he was good, yeah. He, he just really... Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard him brag or, or be wonderfully secure. And I feel that also probably if you are that, you're also dead. You know, I don't think secure. this thing, they all strive for the great <laughs> self-esteem. I think uh, in the estimation of others, you have to be good. You know, the self-esteem thing doesn't ever feel right. Mm, no. <laughs> what I love about him, and, and, and he shared this with Marty, is the choice of film themes. I mean, he clearly was someone, it seems to me, 
who wanted to treat cinematically great ideas mm -hmm. or great human beings. He wanted to do Napoleon. Mm -hmm. He wanted to find and make a film about Paths of Glory uh, was about war. Full Metal Jacket was about war. He wanted to make a film about men and women, which was Eyes Wide Shut. He wanted to make a film about Napoleon, which didn't happen because of financing and all that. He wanted to make a film about the Holocaust. But it was like someone who wanted to make films about things that interested him, that he could, that he could investigate, get his arms around, and, and find out things. And Yes? That's absolutely true. He wanted to make films that uh, mattered that had not only good form, but also substance. And while his films are all very different from each other in form, they are not that different if you look very closely, because there is something that connects them all, and that is a very serious look at uh, human nature, human frailty. It's interesting that he wanted to make a film about Napoleon. He read for two years about Napoleon. He was a great expert on Napoleon. What was it that interested him on Napoleon? That a man who is so talented, really one of the great talents of his time as a politician and as a military man, he ruined himself. It was, in, in the end, the, as Stanley always said, the emotions carried him away. And the emotions dictated, and not the knowledge, and not the sharp intellect and the analytical thinking. And this is true all the time, and this goes through his films. In 2001, the computer didn't malfunction. The computer was perfectly fine. <laughs> it, was the, <laughs> the, it, was the, it was operator error. <laughs> the, um, yeah. It were the people who told the computer to not disclose information that to screwed lie. him yeah. up. To the lie. opposite of what yeah. a computer is. And um, so, yeah, all his films are very different. And uh, when you say, you asked Christiane before, how did he think of himself? The word genius was clearly not allowed. Not allowed. Absolutely. If you not someone allowed. said, Stanley, you're a genius. Oh yeah, <laughs> but can you write it, it, it was almost came close to insult, mm. because you know Bach always said about himself when he was called a genius that genius is ten percent talent, which is the mystery, yeah. which we don't know what it is. Ninety yeah. percent hard work. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. It's, 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 it's yeah. about inspiration and perspiration, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Hard work. Yeah. And that's what it was. Then that was. It, it was almost like a. Yeah, he was a hard worker. I mean, some people call him obsessive. Yeah, what does it mean? A perfectionist. I consider it a compliment yeah. to be a perfectionist. Yes, he was, and he was very demanding. It was very difficult. But so what? Yeah. As a student of film, which you are, and you've done television surveys of film, what is it that interests you most about him? Well, I think um, as a filmmaker. You have to tell a story to the audience. Um, and in so doing, you have to translate it through an image, which means that you direct the eye and the heart right. to look in a certain way, the way you want it to be, the way you want them to see it. And I never saw anybody tell a story that way. Pretty much every one of the films. Pretty much every one of the films, you can study the shots. Uh, first of all, you don't go study the shot. You go look at the movie, and it affects you or doesn't affect you. Yeah. They affected me. And then I went back, when I began to learn more about filmmaking, I went back and I kept saying, why is that one so powerful? Why is it so powerful? And I went back and I tried to trace backwards the shots. And then eventually, you know, eventually it was, I started making films before there was video. So yeah. I had to do this going from theater to theater, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was a different thing. I was trying to write down notes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it be, why does something stay um, with you for so many years? Why did the tracking shots and pads of glory yeah. stay with you? Um, uh, it's really uh, a person with a very strong powerful uh, storytelling uh, ability, uh, uh, talent, genius, um, uh, who could create a solid rock image mm. that has conviction. Yeah. And that, that is the image. What's in that frame stays in that frame. What isn't in the frame is out. And that's it. You have to compose it in that frame. I didn't know he was a still photographer before. Until you saw this documentary? No, I knew that. I knew a few years later. Right, I, know, right, I, right. I never, We never really actually met. But I... I've read over the years, uh, uh, Steve Spielberg told me about him and, and that sort of thing. And I said, of course, the still photography, once you get that image. But then it moves. Still cameras don't move, you know? And yeah. so it had this right. extraordinary authority saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the story this way. And you're going to see it this way. Um, mm -hmm. Then you add to that what I, what I feel about his pictures. When you add to, the, you add to that, assuming there's good, there's good and there's bad, assuming something is wrong and something is right, what are we 
ultimately, as human beings, are we fundamentally good? Are we fundamentally bad? I think I think there's there's where you. That's why they. That's why they. They. Uh, they you can you can watch these films again and again and again. The Shining uh, is 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 fascinating for that. It's really all going on in his head, Jack's head. Yeah. You know, but those those scenes that's so. Well, even eyes wide shut, uh, with the husband touching areas that yeah. he probably should have left alone. You know, being too confident about himself yeah. in a relationship. Um, remarkable film, remarkable. Yeah. And the more you see Eyes Wide Shut, the more the more you get involved in that world. At a certain point, you don't want to because it's too painful. But um, uh, it's uh, it stands up. It holds. Bertolucci was saying this in Rome, and uh, about Eyes Wide You've Shut. You've been filming too. in Rome, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said, oh, that Eyes Wide Shut is really good. <laughs> yeah. He did really say that. Yeah. 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 Now, how did he, he put you into his world? He said, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> how did you feel about Eyes Wide Shut? I've uh, lived with the story for a long time because he read it in, oh, ages ago, and yeah. in 68, when 2001 came out, yeah. he, he was going to do that next. And uh, From after 2001, he yeah. was going to be that. He, he, he thought, I, I've got it. And, and I was, we, we were very young still, and I thought that is a very moisture seeking story, uh, very uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd known plays by Schnitzler and somehow I, I just really responded as probably young people do with fear mm. uh, to this and great discomfort and uh, fear yes because because he would have these stories at home and write at home and he he would I don't know it, it was just oh we had fights <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was very strange and and you know, it's this sort of thing where you, I don't like the story. Why don't you like the story? Yeah. And you're and you're off. Why don't you and, like the story? And it becomes yeah. third degree. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> then uh, uh, he read Clockwork Orange and then did that first. Yeah. And I was much relieved at the time. And uh, but it, I knew it wasn't going to go away. It was yeah. always. You there. knew something he's going to come back to eventually. I was going to make it. And luckily, I think. Being so much older, um, it was then a much wiser film, not so furious anymore. Yeah. He had wisdom about then. what men can uh, never know and what women will know. Men can never know <laughs> and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, I think it's a very wise and very thoughtful film, and uh, I think very much in the spirit in which it was written. Were you surprised by the reaction of the critics? Yeah, I always am. You are. Yeah, I, I, I always imagine what will people criticize and what will they like, and I'm always wrong, and always very indignant, as I suppose anybody who's honest is. Yeah. Yeah, hurts. Hurts. It hurts. Because so many years, so much of your. Yeah. Yeah, and and and, and it even stinks to admit it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Roll tape, eyes wide shut. Here it is. It's because he wants to f me. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't think it's quite that black and white, but but I think we both know what men are like. You said as we we're watching this, he was outside the room. You said he's standing outside. The camera was. Yeah, it, it's called a hot head. Forget the term. Yeah. The camera is on a remote, and you, you Stanley, was sitting outside and watched at the monitor and controlled the movement of the camera. He was a good operator. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, so they were all alone. They didn't see anybody else, and they experimented. You see, what we could afford to do is take time. Yeah. You and what? We could afford to take time. Oh. So we took, you know, it doesn't matter. We could afford to take time. We could afford to take time. Our, our budget was so, I mean, we typically spend in a, in, a, in a week what equivalent films spend in a day. We had a minute crew. I mean, Stanley always said, count the, at the lunchtime, count the plates. <laughs> if there are more than 50 right. plates to be washed up, it. something is wrong. It's the way to do it. Way to do it. <laughs> yeah, more money, less freedom. Yeah, you know, that's exactly yeah. right. I mean, you just have to, you know, to control that, uh, that unit, that actual production yeah. unit, day by day. And keep yes. shooting. Save your money for what's on the screen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The, the, um, but there was always this about Stanley that's reflected in your documentary. It always took him a while to make a film. Yes. 
absolutely. I mean, yeah. part of it's a perfection. Yeah, and it's also you see he didn't he didn't plan to do it that way. <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you when we did the schedule when the first assistant director Brian Cook and myself proposed an original schedule for Eyes Wide Shut. We proposed 24 weeks yeah, uh, because we thought we wouldn't get much mm. more. Yeah. He said, 24 weeks? It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, you know, these are two people talking. We can go. And I had to reduce it to 18. <laughs> he meant it. He meant it. Oh, yeah, you yeah. can understand. Yeah. I'm so to hear. How long to hear. <laughs> <laughs> this will make you feel good. Please. Yeah. <laughs> now, and how long did it take him? Oh, it took a year. A but year? It, yes, it took a year. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't really matter. And Warner Bros. They yeah. were not they overly were alarmed. We went a they bit. were not alarmed. No, we yeah. went a little bit over budget. Yeah, but that's because they love the association with Terry. I mean, Terry Simmel loved the Association uh, yeah, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't have loved the association had he gone over budget 300%. He didn't. Yeah. Yeah. He always delivered. Yeah. He delivered the goods. Mm -hmm. And even if he went 10% over budget or so, that doesn't really matter that much. But he went sometimes over schedule. And for good reason. He didn't make any shortcuts. He wanted it to be as good as it can possibly be. That's why he was counting the dinner plates. <laughs> because if you, had, if you have more than 50 dinner plates, there's yeah. something yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he knew that the num too many people are... Uh, that, that's but what he, he wasn't arrogant saying, oh, I'm so profound, everything uh, no, takes no, me long. No. At, no. no, he was unhappy. Yeah, he yeah, would yeah. like to yeah. think quicker. Yeah. What did chess mean to him? Oh, this is, he played it extremely well. Yeah. And... Uh, at some point, I think he made a living with it. <laughs> you mean he was a chess hustler or a something like that? As, 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 a young New York, as a young man, yes. And, uh, Throughout his life, he played. Yes, yes, he did. And unfortunately, I, I, no, I can't do it at all. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't play with Would him. Would he play on the set? Yes, uh, during Strange Love and uh, various other films, he played Full on the set. Jacket. Full yeah, minute. and and also yeah. with uh, uh, in the Shining and uh, whenever yeah, he could. Shining, whenever he there was somebody, somebody who was really good. Yeah, yeah. He, so he's he looking for competition. Yeah, and yeah. he later yeah. then later in life he played with a computer. Oh, he did. He became <laughs> interested in the computer. <laughs> yeah. You said that with a certain exasperation. <laughs> yes, because he was exasperated with it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was the most exasperating thing about Stanley for you? Exasperating. Exasperating. Um, I think he was, he was, because of the aforementioned intensity, he tended perhaps to be domineering, and, but having all women in his family didn't always succeed. <laughs> so we fought back. But he, uh, without him, we're also like, without an umbrella, it's very horrible. And um, it, he wasn't in the end exasperating. I mean, no, you know, I, I feel very lucky. What does this film mean for you, this compilation of his life, in which you contributed early, mm. private moments? Yes, we, we, I was really nervous that because we were so sad, we tended to be sentimental and, and, and cute and indiscreet, and we had all the material to be so, and then we quickly took it away. Um, because the sort of gushing stuff that families do is, is, is vomit-inducing for others. And also, <laughs> yes. Stanley looked over our shoulder, he would have been very upset. So we were then very disciplined and very conscious of his Interesting thing. Now, did you feel that he was looking over your shoulders, you were putting this together, because you'd spent all, so much time with him as a filmmaker, and so he was there in the presence of a film about himself? Um, only actually very little because I was, I was so used in representing him and being loyal to him that I didn't break that loyalty after his death. I ha had very specific aims. I wanted to show the man as he was comprehensively. Now you could ask who was he. Yeah. The first answer is he was one of the most important American film directors and one of the most important artists of his generation. He was also a real New Yorker. He stayed a New Yorker. And I not only wanted to have certain uh, people, his friends and other actors and colleagues, to contribute. I, want, I was made myself a name to specifically get four people who didn't work with him into this documentary. This were Ingmar Bergman, Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, and Steven Spielberg. And I was, I'm very grateful that I got three of the four. Um, Ingmar Bergman unfortunately couldn't do it. 
And I think that was very, very important, Woody Allen and Martin Scorsese, because they were also New Yorkers, and they were people he admired. He loved their films. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And Steven Spielberg, he always had a relationship with. They, they talked on the telephone all the time, and of course he offered him years ago to be the director of AI. And um, a wonderful scene, I think, in my documentary is when Steven Spielberg um, tells about this visit in his kitchen. <laughs> and he says, well, and, and I didn't believe it, but, but uh, Stanley actually offered me already a credit card <laughs> saying, oh, a uh, Stanley Kubrick film, a Steven Spielberg uh, yes, AI. And uh, then, however, and Stanley was very serious about it because Stanley felt that Steven would have sort of more the knack for this kind of huge fairy tale that it yeah. is. Well, and then it didn't happen, and um, uh, he both made other films, and he did Eyes Wide Shut, and uh, I'm, I'm really, really, really gra gl very glad that then after Stanley's death a year later, it came to be that, that Steven Spielberg, in fact, did make AI, and did it beautifully, and I mean, I'm so impressed by the film, because he is really the only director who had the moral authority to take it on because they, they had already collaborated and but however really put his own handwriting on it which is also necessary and mm -hmm. uh, yeah so I had very specific aims with this film and I hope um, okay but one of the aims was to as you were talking about this take Marty who's so yes, powerful mm. in the film mm. because he was a filmmaker of the same generation and he, Stanley and loved, Stanley his, loved films, his films, and he was a New Yorker. Yeah, and he was a New Yorker. <laughs> yes. but, but here is Martin Scorsese, who yes. lives in New York. Yeah. Stanley lived throughout the latter part of his adult life in London. You know what his daily newspaper was? The New York Times. The New York Times. <laughs> 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 he should have loved the internet then. I mean, by goodness, exactly. he could get it all on. Exactly. You know? We did it wrong. Did. Yeah. You did exactly. the same thing wrong. wrong. You, yeah. Yeah. I did. My wife did. I, I, yeah. I don't know how to use a computer. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but, but how do you explain the fact that, that he felt like for creative purposes he had to stay in We were sent London. there. Because it, in the beginning, to make really? Lolita, it was 40% uh, cheaper yeah. because of the ED plan, which is a tax thing. Uh -huh. And then we were in England, and our children grew up there and went to school, and it became harder and harder to leave. And um, we also loved living there. It's, it sort of happened. It wasn't a plan we're now going to stay. And it wasn't there. a reason to reject New York, I mean, a sense no, no, of... No, no, he didn't reject anything. It, it wasn't a need for but privacy, by the time, it was just happening. No, no, no. By the time we were there for a while, we sort of were involved with other people and the children to school. Yeah. It's very difficult to take children out of school. Of all the films he made, which one speaks to you most? Is there some part well, of this collected works that says to you... I think um, it's hard. It's hard to choose one of, right. of, of the pictures. I, I have um, uh, very strong feelings about Barry Lyndon and about 2001. And those two, out of, out of Lolita, out of uh, yeah. uh, Clockwork Orange, out of Eyes Wide Shut, and that sort of thing. But uh, 2001, uh, it's a strange thing. I mean, when I saw it at the Capitol Theater here, you know, as I said, uh, you know, when his name, uh, of course, there was some great deal of written about the film or written about the mystery of the film before before it was uh, before it was released and so um, when uh, when I went to see it I expected much more than a film and I, yeah. I and as I said we got it you know and I think what I, I guess I'm, I, I've been very affected by religion in my life and that's sort of, mm. that that side of of of, of me uh, found an extraordinary um, extraordinary uh, uh, kind of comfort mm. in the end of the film a very beautiful moment. Roll tape, 2001. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? You screened this, 2001, yes. for the Vatican six yes. months ago. Yes. The Vatican invited. Warner, asked Warner Brothers and you know whether they could screen 2001 and invited Christiana and myself and uh, <laughs> one of the cardinals gave a little speech of saying why, why this is such a monumental film and um, Stanley also received a prize from the Catholic Church at the time 
for making 2001. He was actually very, very surprised because he had a bad time on Lolita with the Catholic Church. But they gave him a prize for 2001. And I mean, the reason is because it is a very reverential film. It makes a, it's a big bow uh, to the unknown creator. Stanley passion. was not a religious man, but he was very, very respectful to the unknown and to the origin of what is. Did he think after he wanted to make a film about the Holocaust Yes. And he didn't because of Schindler's List. Correct. Did he ever want to go back to that theme, or did that that I idea? don't think so, because he uh, and, and next in line was clearly for him Eyes Wide Shut right. and AI. And so, AI. So he yeah. had two films out. Yes. Uh, two, now these were the next two films. Yes. You know, after he gave up on on Aryan Papers, which is a wonderful script mm -hmm. on a great book yeah. by Louis Begley right. called right. Wartime right. Lies. Right. 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 Uh, do you have a favorite? People ask me that, and I've really I thought about it. And no, I, I, I also I have a weakness for Barry Lyndon, and I love 2001. Why do you have a weakness like for Barry Lyndon? I just, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm also a painter, so yeah. I just yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. Many good I'm canvases. wiped up yeah. <laughs> each time. The look of it, yeah. 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 But also his character, a poor guy. Yeah, yeah. the character. Oh, he's doomed yeah. from the beginning. Absolutely. And then that great last line where the, everyone's mm. equal now, yeah. from Thackeray. Yeah. 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 I did like, um, I was sort of nervous going into the Vatican and sitting there with 2001, and I thought this, and the film looked sort of small up on a big church wall. I thought, oh God, it's really a little agnostic prayer. <laughs> you know, we, we are also thinking about these things, and it was very moving to see it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the style. I mean, was this revolutionary at the time? Oh, Lord, yes. I mean... Uh, you'd come off the style, a wonderful style, coming out of England, I think, uh, Richard Lester, The Hard Day's Night, The Beatles, uh, right. the way MTV is affected now, uh, films, uh, uh, MTV cutting, uh, uh, commercials were affecting, I think, oversimplification, mm -hmm. I guess, but commercials were affecting uh, cinema editing and, uh, and uh, logic, in a way, continuity uh, at the time, and Richard Lester was, like, in the forefront of that, and uh, the knack and how to use it, and knack and how to get it, I should say. And um, when 2001 came out, everything screeched the other way. It was amazing because it simply stopped um, how you normally would experience time and forced you again yeah. with great authority to look at a world, part of it in conjecture, part of it based in scientific fact, but to take you somewhere else completely where you've never been before and it really made you, uh, immersed you in, in the drama. I thought one of the great murder scenes of all time is the destruction of Hal. Mm. For yeah. example, it's an extraordinary yeah. murder scene, really. Mm. Yeah. Uh, his murdering of the other scientists who were in, the, who were in, the, uh, who were sleeping, mm. or just says malfunction, you know. And uh, the red, yeah. you begin realizing it's it's uh, it's a person take it's this machine taking their lives. But um, uh, again, basically, as I say, it's a murder scene. But look how it's done. I can feel it. My mind is going. There is no question about it. Uh, you've never seen anything like it, I think. We didn't see anything like it up at that point. I still don't think you, you, you've, you've been immersed in a world in that way. Uh, certainly not in commercial, quote commercial cinema, unquote, you know, at that time. Coming out, MGM presents, and suddenly you're taken to another time frame. Right. What did he think of actors, and how did he choose actors? Carefully, slowly. <laughs> now, I mean, <laughs> certainly, I mean, uh, the decision to use Tom Cruise came very, very quickly, actually. That may have been an exception. And he was very, very Based happy. on a Cruise film or based on yes, just a... Yes, he wanted, he wanted a young man uh, who was good-looking, successful, for this rather normal New York doctor. There was, wasn't supposed to be anything special about him. Rich, successful beautiful wife, everything was fine, a whole we world. We thought. We <laughs> thought, <laughs> yeah. And I think his, his casting was brilliant in Ice White yeah. Shot. Yes. And, and, uh, How about Jack Nicholson in oh, The Shining? He was, I think, a complete master. Yes. No, that was a very deliberate choice, yes. I, I don't remember that we had ever an alternative. No, I think, no, I think uh, he wanted Jack Nicholson right away. I mean, The Shining happened because he got Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. I, w I would put the point that, that uh, Tom and Nicole were chosen even stronger and that he wanted two people who are so perfect, great looking, very sexy, no trouble in any field mm. as only, only of their own making. 
they do it themselves. Yeah. They're not. Other people might have psychological problem or be very ugly or unsuccessful, and there uh, well, would be side issues that would exactly. destroy the impact. But these, there's nothing wrong for them, except what they're doing. Mm. Roll tape. Here is a shiny. We'll come back to actors uh, Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall. Here it is. <laughs> Yeah, we should say this. I mean, you're talking, and as we see this, I'm just he, <laughs> he makes the point that you, the camera, which is there, follows the axe back and then follows yeah, it forward with great, with great control. Yeah. It does. It's not handheld. Yeah. It pans calmly, but, yeah. but not calmly. There's a kind of tension when when it reaches a certain position, then pans back. And it's a very interesting thing oper operating yeah. too, mm, camera right, operating. Right, you know? right, right, and you said all kinds of angles. I mean, he shot. He ran, ran through right. about 15 doors and shot angles everywhere. Yes, he, he covered himself fully because he didn't edit during shooting, right. which is an unusual way, maybe doing. But that's was his choice. That's how he liked doing it. He wanted to be able to edit after he got there. He wanted everything, Absolutely. every possibility. Yeah. And I said to Marty, it'd be great to watch movies with you because you notice so many things. And you said, Stanley talked all the time. <laughs> and, films, he, yes. and you would say, just shut up. <laughs> yes. Well, I would say, no, 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 just, just be quiet for a moment. I want to hear what they're saying. Okay. <laughs> he loved movies. Loved, loved, loved them. Yes. They like this guy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So zillions of them. So screenings, everything could get his hands on. If he saw, if he heard about an actor, if he heard about a film, yeah. he'd call so up Warner Brothers, somebody, he, he give me this movie. He saw single scenes over and over. He saw whole films. He saw some really dumb films. Interesting. Um, uh, yeah, uh, where there was one weird. scene that he was waiting for. Yeah. Yeah. He saw films where he, where he was embarrassed being caught seeing them. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> good to hear. That's <laughs> <laughs> this is good therapy for this you. This is great. I didn't know any of this. <laughs> All those things you thought you were. <laughs> you late at night. You'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'll just watch this by myself. Yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. will ever know. <laughs> but he preferred to have somebody with him. He did to, yes, to he talk like and it. react. He has also to to change reels, you know. Because yeah. <laughs> we, we change typically. I mean, if you watch yeah. the film, you know, I I change and he went and changed yeah. the next oh, one. Great. But he was very fair. Yeah, and uh, uh, we sometimes had ten films sitting yeah. in the projection room oh, on the weekend, yeah. you know. And then, oh, what, what shall we see? You know, I have this and this. Oh, well, this is a nine reel. Oh, no, I don't uh, know. I mean, let's go this one, six reels. <laughs> older films, too. Older films, not just new ones. Oh, everything. A mixed yeah. bag. Right. And, oh, uh, he, uh, you know, he was a real movie buff. Yeah. And he saw a lot of foreign films also. Yeah. And he loved certain directors colossally, and he would oh. never miss a film of these directors. It's not only uh, Scorsese or Woody Allen. Mm. He would never miss Carlos Sara film. Mm. Uh, Carlos yeah. Sara always wants oh, to see. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And uh, or a Spielberg film. All the major films, of course, he saw automatically, but also smaller films that you, you can't even get a print. Yeah, he adored. I mean, for example, the Swedish film called The Immigrants in the New Land. Oh, yeah. He was so enthused. We yeah. hired yeah. we hired the um, costume designer for Barry Lyndon. And then oh. uh, that woman <laughs> together came with, uh, with yeah. uh, Milena Canonero. And uh, what's her name? Ulla Britt Söderlund. Yeah. yeah. And she, <laughs> she, she died then later, yeah. unfortunately. I but think it was Tom Cruise or maybe someone else. You just loved being with him because of all the, just the fact that, that while he was d difficult, tough, obsessive, mm -hmm. driven, passionate, anything I, you agree with all this so far? Yes, although he 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 wouldn't he wouldn't confess to all of those. But you would observe them <laughs> would, to be true. He would reserve a little. I'm, you know, yeah. not as you know. He didn't like to hear being called all these things at once, not in one lump. <laughs> at any rate, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, he was. I forgot what you asked me. Well, I was, hadn't gotten there yet. I was going to say, <laughs> but but he. What was it like being on the set with Stanley Kubrick? Was he? I mean, did he have? Did he? he I think Cruz said, Tom Cruz said, he just loved to have friends for dinner. He loved to be able to, he, to uh, talk. He, he was yes, interested he, in everything. He talked all the time. He liked talking, and, and it was very interesting. I had the greatest floor show any woman's ever had really? all my no, life. Meaning what? Uh, meaning interesting stories. Constant. Interesting life. Interesting. It was interesting. He interpreted the news. He interpreted the news for me. Now I don't. He, he told me what to believe and what not to believe in the news. And 
Yes, yes, he was interesting. Mm. And uh, a horrible gossip. He, a horrible gossip? Oh, gossip is good, isn't it? Yes, yes, he thought so. <laughs> so a, do I. A really good gossip. <laughs> everything about everybody, right? <laughs> Nitty gritty, yeah. everything. Mm. But he got up in the morning thinking about movies and he went to bed thinking about movies. Yes, and uh, he wouldn't have put, again, he wouldn't have, yes, of course yeah, he thought about films yeah. all the time, but he, I think he was just like a huge radar dish, everything, just took yeah. it in. And yeah. sports was very important. Mm -hmm. Now this, I could not, I couldn't <coughs> get anything in my documentary, I mean certain things have to be leave yeah. out. He absolutely adored good sports. Like soccer, like, like football, soccer, like, like tennis. Second week Wimbledon. For some reason, everything quieted down in our office. <laughs> he loved it. And I remember I saw a match with him between McEnroe and Boris Becker. Oh, that was a great... Absolutely. Yeah. It was absolutely amazing. And, and we were riveted. And afterwards he said, hmm, I don't think any movie can come up to that level of excitement. See, that's great. <laughs> it is because you never know what's going to happen. That's the yeah, great thing yeah. about sports, isn't yeah, he it? He loved it. Yeah. Yeah, he loved it. It's an important part. Anyway, his first film was really about sports, was about boxing. Yeah. It's the day of the fight, and that is very well covered in the documentary. Yeah. Take a look at this. This shows you, this is a man surrounded by women all the time, his wife and his kids. Here it is. Do you know what kind of a camera that is, what it's called? It's a home movie. Our reflective film. Do you often find me in a temper? Yes. Oh, I don't believe that. I can't believe that. Well, you better believe it, because you just went in a temper a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, because you can't do a stupid film, because everyone giggles. I and think because I'm... then I can't play like that. I think I'm one of the most even-tempered people you'll ever meet. <laughs> Tell me about that. Uh, he made family films. All the time? Yeah. And we insisted that he was to leave his director's hat behind. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> They were usually us as victims to some new camera. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, it's, it was in sound. This was all new in those days. It was never working properly. And we were so horrible to him. We, we, we didn't do it well. We were impatient. And how much longer do we have to be here? And he, he said, I have not appreciated at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He was. I mean, he was. It was, was very boring to do. It's very funny, and we're very glad we have the films now. But he yeah. uh, would have us do all sorts of things. Well, you can imagine. Yeah. I think yeah. we're not the only family, actually, that did that. No, no, no. no. no Most no, no. families do. I mean, that, that, yeah. there's always a great story about larger families where the kids who were born first would say there'd be all these thousands and thousands of, of still or movies, and yeah. all of a sudden, by the fourth kid, nothing. Said, much. Nothing. Okay. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They've learned the list. The. Um, how hard was it in making this for you to say, I have to be rigorous, I have to, be, I have to show the man that I know? Well, it was very hard because... Yet, but this was a man you loved, this was yes. a man you worked with, this Absolutely. was a man you cared deeply about. Yes, it was hard to leave things out. It requires an enormous discipline because it would have been much easier to make a four-hour film. Yeah. A fantastic material, art department material from 2001 that nobody has ever seen. I would have loved to bring this in. But, you know, that was not the topic. Uh, I would have loved to have much more material, for example, with Martin Scorsese or Woody Allen yeah. or all the others. Many people I interviewed haven't used a single frame. Who? Tad Ashley, Marisa Berenson, Todd Field, Lily yeah. Sobieski, Vanessa Shaw. Uh, uh, yeah, I, c I had no room. I had no time. And you can't be too cutty. Yeah, if the if the cuts right. are too no, short, you have to let it breathe. Yes, you have to yeah. let it breathe, and yeah. I, you have to uh, right. give the impression that actually you're not rushing. From time exactly to time, right. you have to come down and really be quiet yeah. and show a clip and let it run long enough, because if the audience feels you are rushing, then the whole thing is destroyed. Or is there something about the life he lived and the way he lived his life? When you look at the talent that might have enabled him, if he did it differently, to be even better as a filmmaker, as an artist. You know, did anything. He was wondering. Did, he was wanted. he in any way self, you know, counterproductive to his own work? He didn't think so. He, he thought if he could find a reason why he can't knock out films faster, he would have liked to have known the reason. He, he thought he wants to really find a good story.
Yeah. And until he'd found the story, he wasn't going to do it. And uh, it made him very unhappy when it wasn't happening, when mm -hmm. he couldn't find it. And he, he, he thought, oh, God, is it that I just can't tell anymore? What's the matter mm -hmm. with me? Mm -hmm. And it made him miserable when he had to give up the, the uh, 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 Holocaust film, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. He had read so much about that and had become very depressed. And Napoleon. And Napoleon. Yeah. Napoleon, he was furious that he couldn't get it. He still had a s sneaking hope maybe he could still do it. Yeah. He did. He did. You have films like that that you, I mean, you've made, <laughs> uh, that you just... I, I guess over the years I've made them for different reasons. Sometimes just to be able to do the process to relearn how to make a picture. In some cases, yeah. When the industry changed, for example, and the type of film I was making in the early 80s was not accepted that yeah. much in Hollywood anymore, I started, I went back and did independent film after hours and then upped it yeah. again a year later with uh, movie stars, uh, Paul Newman and, yeah. and Tom Cruise and Color of Money to try to learn if I could survive. Um, it's really experimenting, even to keep fear, seeing if I could do a film that, um, uh, I don't know, that has another reason for being, uh, rather than, uh, uh, it's really a learning process for me more than anything else, and still fit within some sort of commercial commercial framework. And that was yeah. the dangerous part. And, and, and I, I, uh, this, is, this is extraordinary, you know, it's, uh, to hear this for the first time, too. I, it's, uh, I, I didn't know anything. I really had never mm -hmm. spoken or, yeah. you know, so it's really interesting because uh, you're right, you have to wait for a story that's worth telling. You really do. Stanley Kubrick died at... Uh, 70 years old, much too young. Uh, this is just a small part of, of what a life in film is about. Um, and this is, you'll see here, uh, the thing that we have been talking about is this Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures of Film by Jan Harlan, edited by uh, Melanie um, Viner Cunay. Cunail. Cunail. Uh, I thank you, Martin Scorsese. Uh, a man who loves film as much as anyone I know, but probably rivaled by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Jan, thank you very much, and especially you, for coming here and sharing this conversation about someone you spent your life with and shared joy and joy and joy, and he died in his sleep, age 70, in London. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. What else is oh, Nicole. And shake his head. And you know him, and nobody ever really knew him. He was known as a, uh, a kind of future threat. One of the all-time great motion picture makers. A future threat to peace and quiet. Legendary meanness. There were times he drove me crazy. He was a very lovable individual. I love him one minute, and the next minute I hate him. I could kill him. Perhaps the most intelligent person I've ever met. He got fascinated with Nescafe commercials. Have you seen the film Groundhog Day? Because they told stories so fast. Well, that's what it was like. This man was born to push the envelope. There is still a part of Stanley that's a great mystery to me. And he always pushed the envelope. And you must expect someone like that to be different from the rest of us. I think we were too scared of him over here. Everybody pretty much acknowledges he's the man. And uh, I still feel that underrates him. <laughs>Stanley Kubrick was one of the most innovative film directors in the history of cinema. When he died on March 7, 1999, he left behind an astonishing body of work. But because of the veil of mystery that surrounded this director, he also left behind many questions about his life and his career. They are revealed in a new documentary, Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures. it was magnificent one of his pictures are equivalent to 10 of somebody else
Joining me now for a look back at the life and work of Stanley Kubrick, his wife of 42 years, Christiane Kubrick, John Harlan, the director of this new documentary and Kubrick's longtime producer, and filmmaker Martin Scorsese. I am pleased to have all of them here to celebrate is what we do here, celebrate an extraordinary career in film by a very interesting man. Let me talk about the filmmaker first. What made him so good? Well, I think at better, what, what can I do? Y you look at that source, you look at that inspiration, you say, well, Kubrick, Kubrick wouldn't let it stay this way. Yes. He would have he changed that angle, he would have worked it out, he would have tried to figure out getting more time to shoot the scene this way or that way. He would have, he would have really seen it through to its end. Yeah. And for that inspiration, I, I must say, I, mean, I must say, uh, it, it's it, looking at his films, um, and there's many ways I look at his films, besides on a big screen. I like watching them on television, I like watching with the sound off. So I can see the rhythm you do of that, the, watching yeah, with the sound off. I, sometimes you can see the rhythm of the cutting and the camera moves. And when he cuts in a two shot conversation, the classic one is Mr. Grady. Yeah. And, um, Jack Torrance in the bathroom, right, right. Uh, crossing the invisible line, right, right, with right. The red background, yeah. uh, the cuts, and uh, when he cuts, when he destroys the invisible line, and when the shot gets tighter, on which line of dialogue? Your son has a very great talent. I don't think you are aware how great it is that he is attempting to use that very talent against your. One thing, you know, you go to movies, you go to movies to be, to be involved in the picture, uh, to get a sense, I just want to, I want to lose myself up in that screen for a few hours, and uh, uh, in a sense, know what it's like to be human, yeah. in a way. Um, then you come across certain kinds of films that um, when you go to the theater and when you see them, you're completely surprised. They make you look at life a different way. They make you look at being human a different way. They touch areas that you don't want to touch sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's provoke, provoke you, which right. is good. Um, and then there's that rarest of films where when you see it continually over years, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, you still see more in it. And what's even better is that if you're making pictures, you go back to this well, this source, for A, inspiration, and B, maybe should be A, is to learn, to learn how to make yeah. pictures, to learn. And remember when you get tired, especially if you make 10 or 12 films in your life, and you, uh, you get tired, you say, why, how can I get that? Who wanted to treat cinematically great ideas mm -hmm. or great human beings. He wanted to do Napoleon. Mm -hmm. He wanted to find and make a film about Paths of Glory, uh, was about war, Full Metal Jacket was about war. He wanted to make a film about men and women, which was eyes wide shut. He wanted to make a film about Napoleon, which didn't happen because of financing and all that. He wanted to make a film about the Holocaust. But it was like someone who wanted to make films about things that interested him, that he could, that he could investigate, get his arms around, and, and find out things. And Yes? That's absolutely true. He wanted to make films that uh, mattered, that had not only good form, but also substance. And while his films are all very different from each other in form, they are not that different if you look very closely, because there is something that connects them all, and that is a very serious look at uh, human nature, human frailty. It's interesting that he wanted to make a film about Napoleon. He read for two years about Napoleon. He was a great expert on Napoleon. What was it that interested him on Napoleon? That a man who is so talented, really one of the great talents of his time as a politician and as a military man, he ruined himself. It was, in, in the end, the, as Stanley always said, the emotions carried him away. And the emotions dictated, and not the knowledge, and not the sharp intellect, and the analytical thinking. And this is true all the time, and this goes through his films. In 2001, the computer didn't malfunction. The computer was perfectly fine. <laughs> it, was the, <laughs> the, the, it, was the, it was operator error. <laughs> the, um, yeah. It were the people who told the computer to not disclose information that to screwed lie. him yeah. up. Yeah. The opposite of what yeah. a computer is. And um, so, yeah, all his films are very different. And uh, when you say, you asked Christiane before, how did he think of himself? The word genius was clearly not allowed 
not allowed. Absolutely. If you not someone allowed. said, Stanley, you're a genius. Oh yeah, <laughs> but can you, it, 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 it was almost came close to insult, mm. because you know Bach always said about himself when he was called a genius that genius is ten percent talent, which is the mystery. Yes. which we don't know what it is. 90% yeah. hard work. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's about inspiration and perspiration, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Hard work. Yeah, and yeah. that's what it was, then that was it, it was almost like a... Yeah, he was a hard worker. I mean, some people call him obsessive. Yeah, what does it mean, a perfectionist? I consider it a compliment yeah. to be a perfectionist. Yes, he was, and he was very demanding. It was very difficult, but so what? Yeah. As a student of film, which you are, and you've done television surveys of film. What is it that interests you most about him? Well, I think um, as a filmmaker, you have to tell a story to the audience. Um, and in so doing, you have to translate it through an image, which means that you direct the eye and the heart right. to look in a certain way, the way you want it to be, the way you want them to see it. And I never saw anybody tell a story that way. Pretty much every one of the films. Pretty much every one of the films, you can study the shots. First of all, you don't go study the shot. You go look at the movie, and it affects you or doesn't affect you. Yeah. They affected me. And then I went back. When I began to learn more about filmmaking, I went back, and I kept saying, why is that one so powerful? Why is it so powerful? And I went back, and I tried to trace backwards the shots. And then eventually, you know, eventually it was, I started making films before there was video. So yeah. I had to do this going from theater to theater. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was a different thing. I was trying to write down notes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it be, why does something stay... Um, with you for so many years. Why did the tracking shots and Pads of Glory yeah. stay with you? Um, uh, it's really uh, a person with a very strong, powerful uh, storytelling uh, ability, uh, uh, talent, genius, um, uh, who could create a solid rock image mm. that has conviction. Yeah. And that, that is the image. What's in that frame stays in that frame. What isn't in the frame is out. And that's it. You have to compose it in that frame. I didn't know he was a still photographer before. Until you saw this documentary? No, I knew that. I knew a few years later, because right, right, right. I, I never, we never really actually met. But I, I've read over the years, uh, uh, Steve Spielberg told me about him and, and that sort of thing. And I said, of course, the still photography, once you get that image. But then it moves. Still cameras don't move, you know? And yeah, so it had this right. extraordinary authority saying, look, I'm going I'm to tell you the story this way. And you're going to see it this way. Um, mm -hmm. Then you add to that. What I what I feel about his pictures, when you add to the you add to that, assuming there's good there's good and there's bad, assuming something is wrong and stuff, so I can see the rhythm. You do of that. Yeah, the sound I, sometimes you can see the rhythm of the cutting and the camera moves, and when he cuts, in a two shot conversation, the classic one is Mr. Grady, yeah. and um, Jack Torrance in the bathroom, right, right. Uh, crossing the invisible line, right, right, with right, the red background, yeah. uh, the cuts, and uh, when he cuts, when he destroys the invisible line, and when the shot gets tighter. On which line of dialogue? Your son has a very great talent. I don't think you are aware how great it is that he is attempting to use that very talent against your will. Remember, it jumped me on. I think, and there's in there a piece in the film where he says, don't you want to be perfect? Does Stanley say something like that to someone? Don't you want it to be perfect? Uh, yes. Well, it is. It's a story that um, it goes like this: uh, Tom Cruise and Sidney Pollack have a dialogue about the many takes and how long it took to do a particular scene, and. Uh, uh, Sydney says, oh, and after three weeks, you know, we were still on this. And then Tom says, well, and Stanley said, Sydney, I mean, I know, I didn't think it would take that long, but don't you want to get it right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the connect between the genius on film that we see and the genius in the man? I mean, what was it about him? Well, the, uh, um... I suppose the reason I loved him is because in his own life he had the same enormous attention to what is important and not peop many people do that so he was very interesting. Yeah. You met him first when he came to California? Yes. Mm, no, 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 no. Why did you meet him first? Um, he hired me in Germany. Uh, he made Path of Glory and he wanted in the end it, uh, a lyrical note. And so he wrote a scene about a girl being dragged on a stage to a lot of rowdy soldiers singing a song. So he's looking for an actress. Uh, 
Yeah. And uh, he hired me. That's how I met him. Roll tape. Take a look at this. Und als man ihm die Botschaft bracht, dass sein Herz Liebchen im Sterben lag. Now, the relationship started soon after that? Um, yes, uh, my shooting wasn't until the end of the film. And uh, he uh, sought me out at a masked ball. Yeah. Uh, there's a big carnival in, in Munich, um, Fasnacht, and all the people that work in theaters, they are hired for great uh, Red Cross balls. So he got somebody to take him there, and um, he looked for me. And that's how I met him. So we were already living together when I shot the scene. So you were living together when you shot the scene? Yeah. yeah. Where, where do you think, I mean, is it just this most difficult question to ask? what makes a great artist. I mean, what was Do it you about? Know? I don't, I don't I, know, but I'm asking. Hopefully it stays a secret. You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting that one cannot know. Um, just having seen AI, I realize that's what's interesting about people, if anything. Well, you've just seen AI, mm. the, the new Kubrick mm. film that finished mm. by Steven Spielberg. Yes. Yeah. yes. And you've Fantastic. seen it, and, and what does it tell you? It, it oh, it pushes many buttons. I mean, and very, very clearly. you you. It's, it's, it's got many layers. It's a wonderful film. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. And I was sort of in an emotional mangle sitting there. And very glad there were so many names to be read afterwards so I could pull myself together. And it's a very, <laughs> very good film. And uh, so what makes an artist? Thank God, you know, you can't explain it. Just hope that it's there hope, and hope that, that it continues. <laughs> How did he think of himself? I mean, he started as a photographer. Yeah, he hoped that he was good. He 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 hoped that he hoped was good. that he was good. Yeah, he he just really. Um, I I don't think I've ever heard him brag or or be wonderfully secure. And I feel that also probably if you are that you're also dead. You know, I don't think secure. this thing they all strive for the great <laughs> self-esteem. I think. Uh, in the estimation of others, you have to be good. You know, the self-esteem thing doesn't ever feel right. Mm, yeah. What I love about him, and, and, and he shared this with Marty, is the choice of film themes. I mean, he clearly was someone, it seems to me, is right. What are we ultimately, as human beings, are we fundamentally good? Are we fundamentally bad? I think I think mm. there's there's where you. That's why they. That's why they. They. Uh, they you can you can watch these films again and again and again. The Shining uh, is, is, is fascinating for that. Mm. It's really all going on in his head, Jack's head. Yeah. You know, but those, those scenes that's so, well, even Eyes Wide Shut, uh, with the husband touching areas that yeah. he probably should have left alone, you know, being too confident about himself yeah. in a relationship. Um, remarkable film. Remarkable. Yeah. And the more you see Eyes Wide Shut, the more, the more you get involved in that world. At a certain point, you don't want to because it's too painful. But... Um, uh, it's uh, it stands up. It holds. Bertolucci was saying this in Rome, then uh, about the eyes wide shut. You've been shot filming too. in Rome, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said, "Ah, oh, eyes wide shut is really good." He did say that. Good, yeah. 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 Now, how he did put he put you into his world? He said, "Yeah, I know." <laughs> how did you feel about eyes wide shut? I've uh, lived with the story for a long time because he read it in oh ages ago, and yeah. in '68 when 2001 came out, he, yeah. he was going to do that next. And, uh, From after 2001, he yeah. was going to be that. He, he, he thought, I, I've got it. And, and I was, we, we were very young still, and I thought that is a very moisture seeking story, uh, very uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd known plays by Schnitzler, and somehow I, I just really responded, as probably young people do, with fear mm. uh, to this and great discomfort. And, uh, Fear. Yes, because because he would have these stories at home and write at home, and he he would, I don't know. It, it was just oh, we had fights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was very strange, and and you know it's the sort of thing where you, I don't like the story. Why don't you like the story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and you're off, Why don't you and, like and it becomes yeah. third degree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> then 
uh, uh, he read Clockwork Orange and then did that first. Yeah. And I was much relieved at the time. And uh, but it, I knew it wasn't going to go away. It was yeah. always you there. knew something is going to come back to eventually. I was going to make it. And luckily, I think, being so much older, um, it was then a much wiser film, not so furious anymore. Yeah. He had wisdom about then. what men can never know and what women will know. Men can never know <laughs> and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so. I think it's a very wise and very thoughtful film, and uh, I think very much in the spirit in which it was written. Were you surprised by the reaction of the critics? Yeah, I always am. You are. Yeah, I, I, I always imagine what will people criticize and what will they like, and I'm always wrong, and always very indignant, as I suppose anybody who's honest is. Yeah. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Because so many years, so much of your yeah, yeah, and and and, and it even stinks to admit it, you know. <laughs> 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 Roll tape, eyes wide shut. Here it is. Is it because he wants to f me? Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't think it's quite that black and white, but but I think we both know what men are like. <sighs> You said as we we're watching this, he was outside the room. You said he's standing outside. The camera was. Yeah, it, it's called a hothead. Forget the term. Yeah. The camera is on a remote, and you, you, Stanley, was sitting outside and watched at the monitor and controlled the movement of the camera. He was a good operator. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, so they were all alone. They didn't see anybody else, and they experimented. You see, what we could afford to do is take time. Yeah. You and what? We could afford to take time. Oh. So we took, you know, it doesn't matter how long. We could afford to take time. We could afford to take time. Yeah. Our, our budget was so, I mean, we typically spend in a, in, a, in a week what equivalent films spend in a day. We had a minute crew. I mean, Stanley always said, count the, at the lunchtime, <laughs> count the plates. If there are more than 50 right. plates to be washed to up, it's something is wrong. It's a way to do it. Way to do it. <laughs> yeah, the more money, less freedom. Yeah, you know, that's it, exactly yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just have to, you know, to control that, uh, yeah. that unit, that actual production yeah. unit, yeah. day by day, and keep yes. shooting. Save your money for what's on the screen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The, the, um, but there was always this about Stanley that's reflected in your documentary. It always took him a while to make a film. Stanley Kubrick was one of the most innovative film directors in the history of cinema. When he died on March 7, 1999, he left behind an astonishing body of work. But because of the veil of mystery that surrounded this director, he also left behind many questions about his life and his career. They are revealed in a new documentary, Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures. It was magnificent. One of his pictures are equivalent to 10 of somebody else's. Oh, Nicole. And shake his head. Do you know him? And nobody ever really knew him. He was known as a, uh, a kind of future threat. One of the all-time great motion picture makers. A future threat to peace and quiet. Legendary. Meanness. There were times he drove me crazy. He was a very lovable individual. I love him one minute, and the next minute I hate him. I could kill him. Perhaps the most intelligent person I've ever met. He got fascinated with Nescafe commercials. Have you seen the film Groundhog Day? Because they told stories so fast. Well, that's what it was like. This man was born to push the envelope. There is still a part of Stanley that's a great mystery to me. And he always pushed the envelope. And you must expect someone like that to be different from the rest of us. I think we were too scared of him over here. Everybody pretty much acknowledges he's the man. And uh, I still feel that underrates him. <laughs> Thank you.
joining me now for a look back at the life and work of Stanley Kubrick, his wife of 42 years, Christiane Kubrick, John Harlan, the director of this new documentary and Kubrick's longtime producer, and filmmaker Martin Scorsese. I am pleased to have all of them here to celebrate, is what we do here, celebrate an extraordinary career in film by a very interesting man. Let me talk about the filmmaker first. What made him so good? Well, I think, for one thing, you know, you go to movies, you go to movies to be, to be involved in the picture, uh, to get a sense, I just want to, I want to lose myself up in that screen for a few hours, and uh, uh, in a sense, know what it's like to be human, yeah. in a way. Um, then you come across certain kinds of films that um, when you go to the theater and when you see them, you're completely surprised. They make you look at life a different way. They make you look at being human a different way. They touch areas that you don't want to touch sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's provoke, provoke you, which right. is good. Um, and then there's that rarest of films where when you see it continually over years, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, you still see more in it. And what's even better is that if you're making pictures, you go back to this well, this source, for A, inspiration, and B, maybe it should be A, is to learn, to learn how to make yeah. pictures, to learn. And remember when you get tired, especially if you make 10 or 12 films in your life, and you, uh, you get tired, you say, why, how can I get that better? What, what can I do? Y you look at that source, you look at that inspiration, you say, well, Kubrick, Kubrick wouldn't let it stay this way. Yes. He would have, he would have changed that angle. He would have worked it out. He would have tried to figure out getting more time to shoot the scene this way or that way. He would have, he would have really seen it to, to its end. Yeah. And for that inspiration, I, I must say, I must say, uh, it, it's it, looking at his films. Um, and there's many ways I look at his films besides on a big screen. I like watching them on television. I like watching with the sound on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah. part of it's a perfection. Yeah, and it's also you see he didn't he didn't plan to do it that way. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll tell you when we did the schedule when the first assistant director Brian Cook and myself proposed an original schedule for Eyes Wide Shut. We proposed 24 weeks yeah, uh, because like we this. thought we wouldn't get much mm. more. Yeah. He said 24 weeks. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, these are two people talking. We can go. And I had to reduce it to 18. He meant it. He meant it. Oh, yeah, you yeah. can understand. Yeah. I'm so good to hear. It's good to hear. <laughs> this will make you feel good. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and how long did it take him? Oh, it took a year. A uh, year? Yes, it took a year. But, you know, it doesn't really matter. And Warner Bros., they yeah. were not they overly were alarmed. Were we went a little they bit. were not alarmed. No, we yeah. went a little bit over budget. Yeah, but that's but because they love the extent. association with Terry. I mean, Terry Simmel loved the association. Uh, yeah, but they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have loved the association had he gone over budget 300%. He didn't. Yeah. Yeah. He always delivered. Yeah. He delivered the goods. Mm -hmm. And even if he went 10% over budget or so, that doesn't really matter that much. But he went sometimes over schedule. And for good reason. He didn't make any shortcuts. He wanted it to be as good as it can possibly be. That's why he was counting the dinner plates. <laughs> <laughs> because if you, had, if you have more than 50 dinner plates, there's yeah. something yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he knew that the num too many people are... Uh, that, that's but what he, he wasn't arrogant saying, oh, I'm so profound, everything uh, no, takes no, me long. No. At, no, he was unhappy. Yeah. He would yeah. like to yeah. think quicker. Yeah. What did chess mean to him? Oh, this is, he played it extremely well. Yeah. And... Uh, at some point, I think he made a living with it. <laughs> you mean he was a chess hustler or something like that? As, <laughs> in, in New York, as a young man, yes. And uh, throughout his life, he played. Yes, yes, he did. And unfortunately, I, I, um, no, I can't do it at all. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't play with it. Would him. he play on the set? Yes, uh, during Strange yeah. Love and uh, various other films, he played Full on the set. Jacket. Oh, yeah, man. and and also yeah. with uh, uh, in the Shining and uh, whenever yeah, he could. Shining, whenever he there was somebody, somebody who was really good. Yeah, yeah. He, so he's he looking for competition. Yeah, and yeah. he later yeah. he then later in life he played with a computer. Oh, he did. He became <laughs> interested in the computer. <laughs> yeah. You say that with a certain exasperation. <laughs> yes, because he was exasperated with it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was the most exasperating thing about Stanley for you? Exasperating. Exasperating. Um, I think he was, he was, because of the aforementioned intensity, he tended perhaps to be domineering, and, but having all women in his family didn't always succeed. <laughs> so we fought back. But he, uh, without him, we're also like, without an umbrella, it's very horrible. And um, 
It, it wasn't in the end exasperating. I mean, no. You know, I, I feel very lucky. What does this film mean for you? This compilation of his life in which you contributed early mm. private moments. Yes, we, we, I was really nervous that because we were so sad, we tended to be sentimental and, and, and cute and indiscreet, and we had all the material to be so, and then we quickly took it away, um, because this sort of gushing stuff that families do is, is, is vomit-inducing for others, and also <laughs> Stanley looked over our shoulder, he would have been very upset. So we were then very disciplined and very conscious of his Interesting thing. Presence. Did you feel that he was looking over your shoulders? You were putting this together because you'd spent so much time with him as a filmmaker, and so he was there in the presence of a film about himself. Um, only actually very little, because I was, I was so used in representing him and being loyal to him that I didn't break that loyalty after his death. I had very specific aims. I wanted to show the man as he was comprehensively. Now you could ask who was he. Yeah. The first answer is he was one of the most important American film directors and one of the most important artists of his generation. He was also a real New Yorker. He stayed a New Yorker. And I not only wanted to have certain uh, people, his friends and other actors and colleagues, to contribute, I, want, I was made myself a name to specifically get four people who didn't work with him into this documentary. This were Ingmar Bergman, Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, and Steven Spielberg. And I was I'm very grateful that I got three of the four. And Ingmar Bergman unfortunately couldn't do it. And I think that was very, very important.